What makes a good leader? How do the best leaders build their teams? How do we create inclusive communities? How do we succeed in fields and industries where most people may not look like us? In this first episode of To The Max, we have the incredible opportunity to learn from someone who has done just that. This is To The Max, advice from today's experts to tomorrow's leaders. When I look back and if you ask me what I wanted to tell the younger me, mm-hmm. I would say, bet on yourself, have faith in yourself, be confident. This is Gita Menon, Abraham Krasnov Professor of Global Business and Dean Emeritus of New York University. She is also the president of the Association for Consumer Research and the Society for Consumer Psychology. During her eight years as Dean, Dr. Menon made NYU one of the most prestigious undergraduate business programs in the world and created the Stern Program for Undergraduate Research. She was also named one of the 20 most influential Indian women in business and the arts by the Economic Times. Today, Dr. Menon will share with us not only her experience as a prominent business leader, but also how she learned to succeed as a mother and woman in a historically male-dominated field. Here are some tips Dr. Menon shared on how young people can become the best leaders, develop confidence, lead productive discussions, and move society forward. So my first question to Dean Menon was, how did her career take shape? And did she always know this is what she wanted to do? I grew up as a Navy kid, Indian Navy kid. My father was in the Indian Navy and I moved 10 schools before I finished my 10th grade. Oh, wow. because of that, I've always been very adaptable, you know, like put me in a situation, I know how to survive. Uh, but I also missed having deep friendships because I moved from year to year to a new school. And so it, it, you, you don't develop those deep connections. So my first deep connections were really those that I developed in college. I, I, I knew that I wanted a career. I knew that I wanted to be independent. I knew that I didn't want to follow the footsteps of many of my um, of what of the expectations of many of my classmates back in India, because when I was growing up, the expectation was that you would grow up and get married and uh, you can have a career, but your family and your duties as a wife are much more important. And for some reason that really rankled me. And in fact, just in protest, um, I started a club in my college called the Anti-Marriage Club. Oh, wow. It's not that I was anti-marriage. It's just that I was making a statement that that cannot be the only thing that people focus on marriage. And so I was the president. I had a treasurer and there was one member. So it was not a successful club. Nobody (laughs) wanted to really join, but I thought I was making a point. Out of three members, I was probably the first one to get the So, you know, so much for that. But in some ways, uh, that marriage, even though it did not work out, opened doors for me. And uh, the only reason I applied for a PhD program is because my husband at that time wanted to get into a PhD program. So I was being, I would think, the supporting role of uh, applying to a PhD program too, because otherwise we'd have to be separated. So I applied with him, took the GMAT, ended up in a PhD program, having no idea what it entailed because I was coming from India. There was no internet. There were no no cell phones. So you can imagine a time where you don't have a lot of information. If you want information about the US schools, you go to the uh, consulate and you pull out these big books and you look through them. That's basically how you got information. Oh, wow. yeah. So I came to a place where I had no family with no money because the Indian government wouldn't let you take out money. Mm-hmm. But because I'm an adaptable person because of my background, I kind of really got into what I was doing at that moment, which is research. I found a great advisor. And you will feel when things are right. And that's what I felt about research, that when I started doing research, I realized that I really love this. I love sitting and thinking about issues. I love the fact that I have the freedom to choose what I research. I did not have a tunnel vision. I did not uh, know anything more than I wanted to be gainfully employed, doing something interesting and being independent. That was a long time ago, obviously. That's like 30 some years ago. And uh, the norms around gender were different. You know, I think um, we've gone through a big transformation 
we are not where we should be in terms of equity, but at the same time, I think we're much better, but we need so much more to go. There was an interesting statistic I read um, for 2018 that uh, there, there were 23 CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, mm -hmm. and there were 21 na men named John who were CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. Oh, really? <laughs> So, yeah, you know, you got to kind of take that in perspective also. Yes, it's great yeah. to make strides. It's great to have whatever six or 7% of the CEOs be women, but we have 400 and whatever uh, CEOs were still men and mostly white. Right. Um, so yes, uh, we need to do more in terms of just moving forward. It's good to celebrate these milestones, but not forget where we are headed. Um, and I guess like on that topic, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about from maybe from your own experience and also what you've seen just being in the business world for so long now, um, maybe some of the biggest challenges that you've had to face um, as a woman and especially as an Asian woman. As a woman, so first and foremost, academia is a little different in that it can be great and it can be terrible. Mm -hmm. So it's great in some ways because you have certain flexibility. And that flexibility typically means you work all the time. But it gives you the opportunity to be there for your kids when they really need it. Um, but the pressures are really, really high. And um, as a single parent, uh, I got divorced one year after my son was born. And as a single parent, it was a challenge because it's the early 90s you're talking about. And it's still not cool for a woman to bring her child to work. Uh, and I got the sense that it was okay for men to bring their children to work because they're caring fathers. Uh, but the women tend to be unprofessional if you drag your kid to work. So uh -huh. I was getting that sense, but uh, I had great colleagues. And uh, very soon I discovered that they didn't care as long as I was showing up for my classes, as long as my research was carrying on. There seemed to be a certain support system. But sometimes you do get the vibe that... Uh, the workplace is different for men and women in terms of just being a parent or being a person who has a life outside of work. Mm -hmm. And people tend to treat everybody the same, but the fact remains that uh, especially as a single parent or as a woman, you're juggling multiple things. So for example, I was unwilling to take on evening classes when, I was, when Rohan was really young because I felt like he, these days are going to pass by and the last thing I want is a is someone else from the outside you know whatever a babysitter or a nanny or whoever putting him to bed every night I used to enjoy reading ridiculous stories to him at night and I didn't want to give that up so you know I want to teach daytime classes and uh, that's what I, I want to do and I think at that time it was difficult for women to ask for things like that because it wasn't the norm People just expected you had someone else to look out for the kid because most people are men and most men were married and they do have people who look after kids at home. And my story was different. It didn't fit that stereotype. So being a woman can be challenging from that perspective. And I hope things have improved, but I don't, I wouldn't say that they are. I mean, the pandemic, the one thing it's taught us is that women are carrying the bulk of home and work. Not to say that men also don't have those challenges, but if you look at it statistically, it's just that women get impacted much more. And then there are social norms that exist within the business community that also affect women. You know, no one is, uh, no one that I've been around has really meant ill, but they end up talking over you or explaining your own idea to you. And you're like, you know, I just said that. And mm -hmm. I understood it when I said it. I don't need someone else to tell me what I said. Uh, so <laughs> the, the thing is that you have to have, so one point I wanted to make in this interview, Max, is uh, there's plenty of research which shows that um, girls have less confidence than boys. And that continues through your lifetime till about 40 years of age. And somehow around that time, there's nothing magic about 40, but most of the data show that at the age of 40, women suddenly gain a lot more confidence and they're much more assured about themselves. They're much more uh, in, in control of how people perceive them and more sure about how they're portraying themselves. And you can see a switch in terms of women being able to control the narrative about their own lives. 
one of the big things that we do as human beings is we always think about ways to improve ourselves. And that's really good because we do need lots of improvement. But don't forget you have strengths. You can improve, but those strengths are what make you who you are as well. So give yourself credit for the strengths you have and be confident in yourself for the strengths you have. And so when I look back, I see that I have grown in terms of my confidence and that happened over a very long period. Mm -hmm. And I doubted myself, I would say something and then analyze it and say, did I do the right thing? Should I have done things differently? And that's good because you can grow as a human being. But I didn't give myself enough credit for being compassionate, for being able to get along with people, for being able to delegate and empower people. Like those are my strengths. Right. And instead of saying I have these strengths, I tended to focus on the things I was doing less well. And so that's what changes over time also. You realize um, who you are, you realize what makes things work and you're able to kind of take a shift and say, yes, I need improvement in these areas, but let me not forget about the things that work for me. Right, that totally makes sense. And I think that's really important just as a girl also like still in high school, but I think especially even in classes, we can see the differences with certain groups of people talking in class, like how often do girls talk in class, how often do boys talk in class, especially in discussion-based classes where you aren't called on. I think being able to have the confidence to sort of step up in that conversation and talk is really important. There's research also which shows that um, girls like to be sure about what they say than boys. Mm -hmm. So if you give a 10 second, think about it this for 10 seconds and then speak, suddenly you'll see more girls participate as well. If you give everybody a chance to speak, the discussion gets richer as well. I wish I could tell girls to have confidence, to say that if you have that thought, it means something. It's, Im it's an important thought. So don't second guess and say maybe it's not important. Yeah, for sure. And I guess since we're on the topic of confidence and empowerment, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you, as a leader, as a dean of a business school, learned how to empower your team. It's really, it's a very good question. There are different kinds of leaders in this world. Uh, one of the key things in being a leader, in my opinion, is when you delegate, you need to make sure that people know you trust them. So when you're delegating, you're saying, look, I need this done. I know you have the skill set to get it done. Go do it. And if you're really into control, you need to set up a couple of touch base meetings. But you don't have to micromanage. You have to trust the person you have told to run with something to run with it. Because otherwise, that's just bad leadership. You chose the wrong person. It's a delicate balance where you need to let go. But at the same time, you need to kind of make sure that you have your eye on the ball, because ultimately, if you're leading a team, the buck stops with you. But you need to have faith in people. You need to trust people. You need to know that uh, they are uh, invested in the same goal that you are. And so developing those relationships with people is really important. I believe that the best teams are those where you can surround yourself with smart people, know what each person's um, pluses are or what their negatives are also, and be able to assign them the right jobs and the right structure of decision-making so that they're able to be successful. It's exciting to work with a team that functions well because it's going to be good results all the time. And yes, you might have a setback or two, but it's worth kind of investing in those people. Yeah, that totally makes sense. And I think that's something that's even applicable, like even in school with people when they lead clubs and their leaders, how do they run the club? Even kind of in that smaller environment, learning how to build trust and connect with people is really important for building a team. And I think those clubs are really, really great starting points for interacting with people, learning how to get the best out of people. So in a club setting, for example, if you're the president of a club, what you're trying to do is make sure that you can tap on different uh, office holders or members and make sure that they bring their best and giving them an opportunity to participate. For sure. That's really important. You need to have participation because without participation, people are going to check out. So right. people have to feel vested. I was wondering if you could talk about um, maybe some advice that you would give to the coming generations of female leaders as they navigate their way in industries that might be historically um, male dominated. So from a, from a point of view of um, a young woman entering the workforce, I think knowing who your 
team is, who your people are, uh, is really important. And then you also have people who champion you, not just mentor, but are actually your champions. And I think in an organization, you typically want someone who will champion your interests, not just give you guidance, but also talk about you more explicitly with other people and recommend you for various scholarships or fellowships or positions um, so that you get promoted, you get treated well, you get your increases, you get visibility. Of course, yeah. Actually, it's pretty interesting that you mentioned that because um, that's one of the things I talked about with Dr. Roslyn Chow last week, um, just the difference between mentorship but also sponsorship um, and those together being really important and not just one or the other. Never listen to anyone who says that you're the wrong gender. Never let someone say to you that the world is not ready for you. You know, I, I just don't have tolerance for that. Uh, and I don't think that it's rare. It's pretty common to tell someone that you're not ready for something or to say that, oh, this particular group is not ready for, for a leader like you. I just find that uh, not very acceptable. These are important things and these are important issues and uh, my voice can make a difference. Creating difference in this world, obviously, as the Dean of NYU, um, we know that you done, ha have a lot of experience with that. Um, and I know as the Dean of NYU, you are known for creating an environment that is prestigious, but also inclusive and diverse. And I was wondering, um, how we can create environments in a community and in teams that are inclusive and productive. I think conversation is important. And very often what ends up happening is those conversations are lacking or they don't happen sufficiently. So if there is a problem, you need to be able to talk about it to hash it out. Sometimes uh, there is no room for conversation just because the transgression is so extreme. But more often than not, people make uh, may unwittingly make mistakes. And so just creating an opportunity for different parties to be heard and listening to different perspectives. One of the great things I admire about inclusion is that everybody comes in with a different background. Mm -hmm. So if you have respect for people's backgrounds and that you learn from different perspectives, then automatically you're richer because your thinking has changed. Of course, yeah. And I guess, what, what would you say are important things that we should keep in mind, especially as young people, especially at schools where we are exposed to a lot of different perspectives? Um, how do you think we can really harness this power of conversation and kind of how we should approach this conversation? Conversation happens when you can give a person the benefit of the doubt. Conversations happen because you're discussing something from different perspectives. And when you have different perspectives, it's likely that you can get caught up with your own perspective and you're not open-minded enough to someone else's perspective. And so just keeping uh, your line of communication open and assuming that just because someone's point of view is different doesn't mean it's coming from a bad place, rather it's coming from a different place. But let me tell you, it's very difficult to practice. We all have judgments about people, right? So when you have certain people in the room, you're like, oh my gosh, they're going to really talk and it's going to be painful. <laughs> Let's just, so I try to say, okay, let me try not to go that with that mindset. So I take a deep breath, drink some water and go into a meeting where I know I'll probably, you know, lock horns, but I try to keep an open mind and say, okay, maybe this person has a different perspective. Let's, think, let's just hear them out. For sure. Yeah. Um, and I guess switching gears a little bit, so I know you're working on a super exciting book project right now. Can you tell us a little bit about what your book's about and how you got the inspiration to write it? So my book has been sleeping. It needs to be woken up. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the genesis of it was really my experiences um, when I was a uh, dean and also my experiences uh, as a woman growing up in India, coming here uh, to the US at the age of 24 the cultural shift I had to make as well as the professional uh, shift. Um, so it's a book that, ta that looks at women and their role in society, in business and in politics. How did women get to a point where we have to fight for equality or the society component? If you look at uh, what's going on with men, it's not like uh, it's all rosy for men. 
You have men who want to wear purple shirts. You have men who want to be nurses. You have men who want to be stay-at-home dads. And there's stigma around all of this as well. So unless we break down the stigmas for men, how can we possibly break down all the stereotypes around women? The business component is more about why is it that women are not promoted with the same criteria as men? So there are, what are some of the factors holding women back at work? There's research which shows that men who spend time with other men doing social events get promoted much faster than women because women are just not hanging out with other people as much because they're tied up with responsibilities. And then politics. How do you get more women to run for office? Why is it that the United States hasn't had a female president? What is it about the election process that creates these roadblocks for women to get higher? Now Kamala Harris is the vice president. That's absolutely amazing. So, um, you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, such a, such a great person. And how did she get to where she is? So uh, politics is more about just getting women more excited about being in politics. Overall, the book is about um, just creating a bigger footprint for women. Oh, that's amazing. And I'm so excited to read it. I can't wait until it comes out. (laughs) I can't wait to finish it. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Yeah, I guess like talking about what kind of footprint we want to create for women, kind of dialing back before we get into the business world, before we even go to graduate school in places like high school and college, are there things that teachers can do? And are there things that um, maybe students can do who want to support their minority or female um, peers to create an environment that fosters um, female and minority students in their development as future leaders? Definitely. I mean, um, one of the things about being a teacher or an educator is to be some form of a role model because you were talking about mentoring. Our first mentors are really our teachers. Creating an atmosphere where um, there aren't differences in choices that females and males make in terms of whether it's the kind of projects you're working on, in terms of whether it's the kind of clubs you join, in terms of what careers you aspire to, just keeping all opportunities open for all. Opportunities are what's going to create a level playing field for everybody. So you need to provide more opportunities um, for people to succeed. And it's not always financial. It could just be the social environment in which you're interacting. Mm -hmm. Having everybody believe that they're a human and this, uh, your race, your gender, your demographics, et cetera, define each person, but that opportunities are available for all. And for people who are playing a more supportive role, who are being allies, I would say that um, they need to develop the tools to be allies or to be activists. You know, you need to know what you should be doing as opposed to, oh, I'm afraid to say something in case I say the wrong thing. So it's not just about learning to survive on your own. It's about helping others. It's a responsibility. Looking forward from what you've seen in the past and kind of what you're thinking about right now, I was wondering if you could talk a bit about what you think would be the greatest challenges that female leaders will probably have to face in the near future. Um, And maybe if you have any closing advice for how they can be responsible leaders. When I look back and if you ask me what I wanted to tell the younger me, Mm -hmm. I would say, bet on yourself, have faith in yourself, be confident. I think female leaders will always have some challenge or the other, but I'm hopeful that the world is going to improve and um, it's going to be, uh, I mean, you have to think about it as each generation of female leaders are the shoulders on which the next generation stands. My life as a faculty member in the marketing department was made much better because of the women who came before me who fought to have a course off for having a baby, for example. I was the first person who benefited. I hope I have worked really hard to create a better environment for next generation of women by creating more policies that encourage, uh, that help women who have had babies take not only a semester off, but also some time off from their tenure clock. 
So it's really important to remember that as a woman, as I walk through certain doors that were previously closed to me, I keep those doors open for future generations. And I open more doors. And that's the only way you can make progress. I, I enjoyed being Dean of the undergraduate college because I met students with so much hope, with so, and male and female, um, and people who don't identify by gender, like across the board, that generation has hope, strength, positive thinking, and they want to make a difference. And uh, with an attitude that you want to make a difference, the world will become different. And that's what I really kind of trust and believe. Wow, thank you so much for that. I think that's a good place to leave off. Well, thank you so much, Dean Menon, for joining me today and also for opening the door to so many young people and women yourself. Um, so thank you. Thanks so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed it and discovered something you can apply in your own life. If you liked what you saw, please like and subscribe. See y'all next time.